Okay, good afternoon. This is Adam York, president over here at Equips. We um, are going to go ahead and get started here. We are uh, very fortunate to have Eric Gustafson presenting uh, the series on transforming financial spaces into retail spaces. Today it's best practices for touchpoint optimization. So we uh, feel very lucky to have Eric presenting. I appreciate you being here, Eric. And um, we're going to go ahead and um, keep everyone on mute just to reduce the background noise. But what we're going to do is at the end of this, take everyone off mute and make um, a time for question and answer available. And Eric's contact information along with mine will be here as well. Um, just a short word about Equips. We manage equipment maintenance for financial institutions with locations in 34 states. And um, so we're not directly um, involved with uh, transforming space, but we are involved with managing that space and the equipment in that space once it has been transformed. So um, with that, Eric, why don't you go ahead and start with your content? Absolutely. Uh, first, we'll start off a, a little bit about Optavia Solutions. Uh, Optavia Solutions has had a history that was built in uh, implementation and construction. We've opened that up to design and technology, and we've found that there's a there's a really hungry spot in the financial industry for consultation and helping some folks work through what it takes to evolve their facilities. So as we talk about optimization, uh, let's get something on the table first to start with. The word transformation and branch transformation is something we hear on a fairly regular basis in this industry. It kind of alludes to the thought of whatever you've got, you need to toss it out the window and start over because you're doing it wrong. And I don't believe that at all. I think optimization is truly taking an existing system that works well and redefining those resources and retooling your existing staff to be able to meet the needs of your customers today, tomorrow, in five, ten years down the road. So having that in mind, know that we're going to take a look at a little bit of where the industry is today, what we're seeing in the way of trends, and then how we need to evolve those touch points to be successful moving in the future. Toward the end of this conversation, I am going to dive in to a demographic that, that has a lot of people scratching their heads. Uh, it's a group called the Millennials. It's those folks between ages 18 and 34, and they bring a whole special set of needs with them and they have some special characteristics, but the other side of that is they're probably some of the most loyal customers once you win them over. So know that after we talk about where the industry is today and what we're seeing as a result of that, um, we're going to talk about how you evolve to meet those ever-changing needs. I'll touch on a little bit of the technology and also would like to plug that we're going to have a couple more of these webinars in the future, and we're going to be talking about technology, facility design, in the next webinar, so we'll get into more of those gritty details of exact cost savings, some of the layout design ideas, and then in part three, we're going to talk about impacting your employees. Because once you have an idea and once you get your facilities up to speed, that technology requires essential support, and that comes from any bank or credit union's most valuable asset, which is their employees. So having that being said, let's go ahead and dive into some of the details and some of the information. Now, the sources that we've used to pull this together are cited at the end of the presentation. And when um, we get through today, Cindy is also going to send out a listing of those sources uh, to everyone that attends the call. I encourage you to go out and give those a good read, because I'm just going to touch on some of the highlights, uh, but there's a lot of great information in there, and it, it gives you some perspective about some of the folks we have coming our way in the banking space. Today, people often use multiple different kinds of institutions to meet their financial need. And we talk about those. Some people are credit union folks. Some people use full service banks. Some use credit card banks. Some use online investment firms. But what we found is that most people are using more than one source for their financial needs. Now, the reasons for that are varied, and I've listed some of those up here. Uh, probably the biggest one that gives you a new account is resulting in indirect lending. You go out and you get an auto loan, something along those lines. But the reason I say that, I put this up here, is to show you what is most popular. Full service banks are by far the most popular for those folks that have regular accounts 
that they use and attend on a regular basis. Now, this slide is a little bit busy. There's a ton of information on here. I tried to make it as graphical as possible, but let me summarize it for you. When you talk about the financial institution that each of those individuals have accounts and relationships with, there was a study performed um, by a group, and that group dove into what avenue people use the most often, which is the blue line, and also which avenue people are most satisfied with. So when they come to your institution today, about 37% of those folks are going to walk into your facility, and they're either going to talk to a customer service representative, or they're going to talk directly with a teller. Um, the next most popular channel is the ATM. Now, you can also put that spoke of a financial advisor. You could squeeze that in with going into a branch, branch excuse me, but those, that concentration should let you know today that there are a number of transactional needs that the only way it can be met is through the branch. And that's why those folks are coming to us. And that is by far one of the most positive driving decision factors when people open a regular account is location, branch, facility, and access. Now, I put these up here to see the satisfaction level, and obviously you can tell the most popular and the one that people are most satisfied with is actually walking into a branch and speaking with the teller. Now, that we don't expect that to change in the near future. People like person-to-person -person relationships. They like to be able to walk into a facility. They like that high-touch feel. And on top of that, they like to know the person that's in that facility has the ability to solve their problem or they can find help to solve the problem. Now. We look at ATM, ATM is growing, uh, and ATM has a high satisfaction level because most of the transactions today that go through an ATM are what I would call routine, mundane transactions, things like checking balance, uh, getting cash, and now with some higher functionality, um, being able to cash a check with a copy of the receipt, uh, copy of the check on the receipt. Now, these trends, I will tell you, are changing. And I'll give you a snapshot. This is a one-year period. So in, in the study I'm referencing, in a one-year period, these are the changes we've seen. Obviously, the big winners send or respond via text, mobile app, um, and also video conferencing. So those people that do, that do regularly visit a facility, their preferences are changing. In a year's time frame, the same group started to adopt mobile app, video conferencing, text for their basic banking needs throughout. Now, the big losers was 1-800 service number and a phone menu. That kind of technology today, uh, it served us well in the past, but moving forward, we're seeing that people are moving away from that. And I, I would have a tendency to say that it's a, it's a direct result of the mobile app. And a lot of those mundane, I need to check my balance. I've got a question about my account. Has this cleared in the past? The only way you could do that was through a 1-800 number or going through an IDR or an interactive menu and finding out if something's cleared your account or what that balance is today. So technology is starting to shift those pieces. Now, I will tell you, which one do you think is more expensive? That's a theoretical question because you can't answer me, guys. But which one do you think is more expensive, maintaining a mobile app or staffing that call center? Obviously, there's cost savings in these trends, and we need to take advantage of those if we're going to remain viable uh, as, as we go forward. Now, online is, has some gain here, but I will tell you that mobile devices are leapfrogging online. So uh, as we look, every two years, folks get a new phone, and that new phone has new capability. Talk about frequency of use at the ATM. Overall, these numbers are going up. Uh, and, and I bring this up to show you that all folks use an ATM in regards to some form or fashion, but 65% say they use it a few times a month or weekly. The trends we see here, there is some change in that 18 to 34 demographic, but the biggest change we're seeing today is that 35 to 64 demographic. 64% of those folks admit to using an ATM on a regular basis, and that was up four points from the year before. Usage is increasing. Part of that is driven by availability, 
Uh, also part of that is driven by enhanced transaction sets at the ATM. So ATMs are evolving to keep up with the times and mitigating some of those transactions that normally happen in your lobby to an ATM reference site. When we talk about different kinds of branches, and we're going to dive into this more in our next uh, seminar when we talk about branching. If you can just, if you stay in your mind, draw an arrow going straight down, and from a cost perspective, obviously a flagship branch is your most expensive branch. Uh, we estimate a branch build, you know, anywhere to three to four hundred dollars a square foot for a new branch build. So when you're looking at a flagship, that's a four point five million dollar investment. And now if you go down that line, if you look at a self-assisted location where you've got an ATM or an inline teller system or some of those things processing your transactions for you, that initial build cost is only around a half million dollars. So technology today and the trends we're seeing today, the good news is it is decreasing the need for flagship and traditional branching, and it is increasing the need for many self-assisted um, and the pop-up style of branching. So the cost of branching is going to go down, but as we looked at our numbers before, the need for branching is ever necessary. So those touch points are changing today because the things that we used to have to go to a traditional institution to get done and to resolve are now things we can do via video conference, via phone, or through an ATM platform. So that's a good thing for financial institutions today that are trying to make um, a living and trying to make a return based on you know, decreasing revenues, um, increasing costs, you know, and, and interest rates that refuses to move. Some of those things are good for borrowers but aren't always good for financial institutions. And as we look at these branches, again, we're going to dive into this one more deeply on our next webinar, but I would say those flagship and traditional branches are in great locations. High percentage of them are in great locations. And when we talk about optimizing, we're not talking about closing that branch. We're talking about retooling that branch, retooling the people inside of it, remodeling, and making it more effective and more relevant for the consumer base you have around it. Um, a lot of people call it hub and spoke design, and we'll dive into that a little bit on our next webinar. Now, when we talk about these changes in branching and configuration, one of the things that has empowered this is the evolution of the ATM. I'm not going to dwell on this a lot because we've all seen and we all know a little bit of this information. Um, when I first came into this game 14, 15 years ago, I was working for a company called Diebold, um, and they talked about branch transformation. In that time frame, branch transformation, in a nutshell, was you need to put an ATM in your lobby. No other transaction set besides withdrawals but that's branch transformation. Now, as that ATM has evolved, the redefinition of its capability has greatly impacted transformation and optimization. So when I talk about it today, the ATMs you have today, a lot of them have upgrade paths after we went through uh, the ADA compliance. We're on a pretty level platform. The things that are really game changers, when you talk about envelope-free deposits where you can present a check, that greatly increases customer confidence. That made a huge leapfrog in regards to ATM usability beyond just standard cash. Some additional pieces that add to that are QR codes, and a QR code is where you can go up to an ATM without a card, without a PIN number, and still conduct a transaction. Now, those types of technologies have security concerns around them but luckily, the technology has evolved and the security protocols have evolved to the point that those are now viable solutions for the ATN and viable solutions for our consumers. And we're seeing them readily presented uh, and, and brought to market. And a lot of people enjoy that. Um, so if you're on this path, keep going. You're doing the absolute right thing, and you're going to decrease cost overall. Now, we talk about ATM functionality and two things. One of these has been out there for a while, ATM deposit automation. And I just put Diebold and NCR up here because they were the first ones I came to on the web, so there's no, uh, there's no priority to either one of these folks. But ATM deposit automation is pretty much mainstream today. Not everybody has it, but all of our consumers are comfortable with it. They've seen it. They know how it works. Um, on ATM deposit automation, 
the thing I put in the back of your head, if you're not doing this today, before you go down that path, know that clearing your check doesn't have to be near as hard as it has been in the past. That technology has largely become a commodity. Clearing the check is the big hurdle in this case with ATM deposit automation. And ATM video assistance, uh, video call centers, the call centers that you have today, those 1-800 folks that are no longer the preferred channel, those folks still have a lot of value. They can be cross-trained, they can be converted to video, so as that channel gets less and less usage in regards to a 1-800 call-in number or your uh, well-trained help staff, that everybody has a great well-trained help staff, those people can evolve into video tellers, and that video capability adds a dimension to the ATM that we never had before. And when I say that, there are transactions that we never dreamed of being able to do via an ATM, opening accounts, um, accepting cashier's checks, printing cashier's checks, cashing you know, checks to the penny. Those were all very difficult things to do. But with this kind of functionality, it makes it significantly easier. Uh, a lot of times your network can be a hurdle on these. And also some of the IT guys don't like the fact that a video and base ATM uh, will consume about a T1 worth of bandwidth connection. So there are some hurdles with this technology, but it is making adoption uh, significantly easier. The other one I'll touch on uh, quickly here is inline teller automation. Uh, this is kind of a buzz out there today. It is a self-serve ATM, or in some cases it's an assisted self-serve ATM where a local branch person can help you. We talk about changing the branch type. This is this type of tool is essential to be able to move from a flagship or traditional branch to more of that cost-effective mini branching, because it takes care of all the heavy lifting of what I would call low-value, high-cost transactions. The ones that take a lot of time and eat up a lot of teller space. They require you to have five or six tellers on a Friday afternoon. This type of technology buffers that. And it is very cost effective. To be able to do a transaction through this type of device, you're looking at about 68 cents. Where if you put it through your teller line, it's about $2.25. So every time you migrate a transaction from your teller line to an ATM or to an automated self-service device, it saves dollars. There's cost savings there. And I would also say that it increases customer service. Because in the shirt, you see the gal in the blue shirt, she's helping that individual. You get more concentrated one-on-one -on -one time with members and customers as they walk into your facility. And if you can understand a member and get to know them a little bit, you have a much better chance of cross-selling or increasing their relationship with your financial institution. It allows tellers to be good at what they do, which is interacting with your membership and that's how you grow margin, and that's how you grow services, and you grow wallet share. Now, we talk about these self-serve devices. I know a lot of people have, have made comments about, oh, I don't know if banking's ready for it. I don't know if I can justify it. I don't know if my membership will move to it. They have experience. Um, if you've ridden on an airplane or if you've checked into an airport in the last four and a half, five years, you have to use a kiosk. And if you don't, people look at you like you've got a horn coming out of your head if you go up and ask somebody a question because everybody migrates to that kiosk. Uh, pumping gas today. It is rare that most people walk inside the building to pump gas. Uh, they swipe their card. They self-serve. You look at grocery stores. Those people uh, self-serve all day long. We have, a, we have a group of individuals in our society that will wait in line to use the self-service device as compared to going through a man station. And I mean, there's a whole pile of reasons why they do that, but industry has trained our customers to accept this type of technology. And when we do a study, and you take a look at the, the just the whole question of would you try it, would you do it if a seller helped you, would you do it by yourself, overwhelming, well, about 60% said, oh, absolutely, we'd try it. And 26% was honest. 26% 26% made the comment of, you know, I really don't know if I would try it or not. So there, there's our swing point of 26 points. If people use it one time and they're successful, they'll try it again. If they use it three times and they're successful, that will become their primary source of interaction 
with your institution for something that doesn't require a body. Now, we talk about there's a need for optimization. Besides cost savings, which that's tangible, the need for optimization is a demographic we have coming up called the millennials. Uh, they're a very interesting group, uh, often referred to as the selfie generation. Um, and I've got some millennials living in my world, and they do take a lot of selfies. But that selfie is not, and that's where you take your own picture with your phone and then you post it. That is not really a narcissistic behavior. It's a result of their desire to be self-expressive self and the fact that they have technology available to them. Now, when I was a younger person, I don't know that uh, I would necessarily want that kind of technology available in my life because uh, I, I had a lot of fun when I was a younger guy, and I don't know if I want to photo document it. But these folks are technology natives. This is how they express themselves is through technology. Um, they are ethically diverse like we've never seen in, an in any demographic before. 43% are non-white. And the reason that they are the largest percentage of the total population is due to immigration. A high percentage of these folks are first-generation Americans. 80% of them have smartphones. 34% uh, have four-year degrees or higher. Uh, and these guys love a great deal, but they will not fall for tricks because they are extremely skeptical. They grew up in a generation um, where they saw economic disappointment. They saw banks that were too big to fail. They've seen a lot of things that have jaded them a little bit, so they're skeptical. So you have to address that as you go to target these financial groups. Uh, they've also seen a lot of economic disappointment. When, they hit, uh, when the millennials first joined our workforce, they saw unemployment around 12 and a half, almost 13%. So they're a different group. Here's some facts about uh, that should get your attention. 71% of millennials say that they said they would rather visit the dentist than hear what banks have to say. 73% of these folks would rather handle their financial services through Google, Apple, PayPal, Square, all those folks. Um, they are skeptical of traditional institutions. As a result, J.P. Morgan Chase is closing 300 branches this year. So. If we don't find a way to serve millennials as credit unions and banks, these other online institutions will find a way. Uh, when we talk about finance, you talk to millennial, they talk about crowdfunding. They don't necessarily talk about banks and 401ks. There's an education point that has to be made here. Now, these folks also bring with them some student loan debt like you would never believe. Those 34% that have degrees, usually have a little bit of debt to go with them. These folks are highly connected. Um, the good news is they're very loyal. They want to be connected online, and they want to be connected offline. So they value a relationship, and they value people that can assist them. They're educated. Therefore, they can be educated. So if you bring a genuine program, and you differentiate yourself, and you make it relevant, you have a chance with millennials. These technologies that we're talking about today are already growing with our baby boomers and our Gen Xers. Uh, they are now starting to roll into this millennial space. Make your, make your deals transparent. When you put an offering on the table, don't put lots of question marks behind it. Or if then, if you have this much in your account, then you get this. If it drops to this, you get this. Make it very clear. Present lots of options. And embrace their values. The millennials are very ethically concerned, they're very environmentally concerned, and you have to leverage those. And make sure when you do market and educate millennials that you do it with a like personality. Because that's who they relate to first. They don't necessarily relate to the old stodgy guy that's got a nice suit, that's driving a nice car, living in a nice house. They don't relate well to that, and that marketing, those efforts are wasted on them. You need to dial it back in, make it relevant, use people they're familiar with, and speak in their terms, and they will be the greatest, well, the largest upcoming market group. And once you get them, they're loyal. So do your diligence now. Uh, get tools in place. Modify your touch points so you can maximize your impact with this millennial group, and you'll do extremely well in, in the near future. They don't have a lot of money today, but they are very educated, 
and very employable, and they will have money in the near future. Here's some of the sources that we've got. Again, like I said, this will be running out to us, uh, running out to you guys here in the near future, right at the conclusion of this. And I have reached my 20-minute mark, and then some. So, um, thank you for attending. Thank you for being very attentive, um, Adam. If you would like, we can open. Sorry, Eric, I muted you there. I did not intend to. I'm going to see if I can unmute you. Um, if anyone has questions, you can put those in the chat area, or if I can unmute, it looks like I have now. If you have questions, um, please uh, present those now. Eric, did I get you back? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, all right, wonderful. Okay. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your, your time, and uh, we'll have your contact information available to folks, too, that they can reach out to you directly if they're more comfortable conversing that way. And really appreciate the content, and thank you to all the attendees. Have a great rest of the day.